Well, thank you for joining, and just a couple reminders as we get started. Uh, first, we've recorded this ahead of time as usual. Uh, we'll be continuing online until we're in our new space, and uh, things with COVID uh, get to a place that that's manageable. Uh, so I just wanted to let everybody know about that. As usual, we'll begin worship this morning with uh, a little bit of music, so let's do that now.
Well, this weekend next, we'll uh, be taking a short break in our current message series through the book of Acts, and we'll be in a two-part series called Here and Back. Uh, As we approach Christmas and celebrate the birth of Jesus, we're going back to Luke chapters 1 and 2 to take a look at the events leading up to the birth of Jesus and reflect on their meaning for God's salvation and for our lives now as we follow Jesus. You know, Jesus' coming has special significance in God's plan of salvation. And the fact that Jesus has come means that he will come back again. Uh, First, to accomplish the redemption of his people through his birth. Uh, His first coming was to accomplish the redemption of his people through his birth, uh, through his life, death, and resurrection. And his second coming is to restore his people and his creation fully. So today we'll look at that, the first part of that, with respect to Jesus' first coming uh, from heaven to earth. As we prepare to do that this morning, let's pray together. Lord Jesus, thank you for who you are. Thank you that you are the Son of God, that you are the exact expression of God's nature. You are the radiance of his glory, that you are the image of the invisible God. Lord, thank you that we have been made in your image, and it is to your image we are redeemed and restored through faith in you. As we come to your word this morning, we're grateful that you've given it to us. We're grateful that uh, we can set our minds to it, and we pray that we would have understanding by your Spirit. Lord, I ask that uh, as people uh, who profess you, we would follow you in word and in deed. Uh, So this morning, I pray that I would be a faithful messenger of your word, and I ask this in your name, Jesus. Amen. All right. This morning we'll be in Luke chapter 1, looking at verses uh, 26 through 56. And as we've been discussing in our study through the book of Acts, uh, Luke and Acts were both written by Luke. The two were intended to go together, and they're essentially volume 1 and volume 2 of the same work. Both Luke and Acts have the same purpose. It's to provide an accurate and well-researched account of everything that happened. Uh, In Luke's gospel, uh, what he's talking about is uh, everything that Jesus said and did during his earthly ministry, as well as the events leading up to that. And in Acts, uh, of everything the apostles did to follow Jesus' instructions, uh, as well as the actions of God through them by his Holy Spirit, as they were establishing the church. Now, I think it's very important uh, as we come back to the, to the start of Luke's gospel to look specifically at what he says in the very beginning of it. Uh, so beginning at verse 1 of chapter 1, uh, Luke says this, Many have undertaken to compile a narrative about the events that have been fulfilled among us just as the original eyewitnesses and servants of the word handed them down to us. It also seemed good to me, since I have carefully investigated everything from the first, to write to you in an orderly sequence, most honorable Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things about which you've been instructed. Now, um, tough to flip the page here with one hand. Now, what Luke's saying here is basically this. Others have already written these things down, namely Mark and Matthew, and what's been documented is the fulfillment of God's word in Jesus. So uh, what Luke is trying to get across to us here is that these are real events, things which really happened, things real people witnessed with their own eyes, heard with their own ears, and in faithful testimony have handed down to us. Luke addresses this to Uh, Theophilus. He's a believer in one of the churches. He may have helped actually sponsor some of Luke's travels and writing and all of this. But the point is what Luke tells him at the end. Everything you've been told and have based your faith on is true. Now, Luke addresses this, as I mentioned, to Theophilus, but he knows he's writing to a broader audience. And what Luke's showing is how God has taken actions in time, actions not only to bring about uh, his promise in Jesus, 
but actions to fulfill all of his word, including the promise of one who'd come ahead of Jesus, and that's John the Baptist. So where we are in Luke's gospel at this point, uh, Luke is, again, reporting on the fact that God's activities are in specific times with real people. Uh, And Luke says, it was in the days of King Herod of Judea, which is Herod the Great, there was a certain priest, Zechariah. He was of uh, Abijah's division. His wife was from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And Luke goes on to tell us about Zechariah and Elizabeth. He says how they were faithful, devout, but childless how they'd been praying earnestly for a son, though they were both past the age when it was naturally possible. Then how, in the course of his duties, uh, Zechariah was chosen for the great honor of going into the temple, into the presence of the Lord and lighting the incense. And there, another great honor uh, was given to him. The angel Gabriel visited him and tells him in verses 13 through 17, Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you will name him John. He will be great in the sight of the Lord. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit while still in the womb. He will turn many in Israel to their God. And he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Now, all of the words Gabriel spoke here are quotes of Scripture. Uh, Genesis 25, Isaiah 8, Isaiah 44, and Malachi 4, 5 through 6. These show God's fulfillment of his promise to send a messenger ahead of the Messiah, and this person will be John, who we know as John the Baptist. Now, not long after this, then, Gabriel has another visit to make, and that's where we join in today uh, in Luke chapter 1, verse 26. So starting there. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man named Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and the angel came to her and said, Rejoice, favored woman, the Lord is with you. But she was deeply troubled by this statement, wondering what kind of greeting this could be. Then the angel told her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Now listen, you will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. Mary asked the angel, How can this be since I have not been intimate with a man? The angel replied to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. And consider your relative Elizabeth. Even she has conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month for her who was called childless. For nothing will be impossible with God. I am the Lord's slave, said Mary. May it be done to me according to your word. Then the angel left her. In those days, Mary set out and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judah, where she entered Zechariah's house and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby inside her leapt, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Then she exclaimed with a loud cry, You are the most blessed of women, and your child will be blessed. How could this happen to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For you see, when the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby leapt for joy inside me. She who has believed is blessed because what was spoken to her by the Lord will be fulfilled. Uh, In response to this, Mary said, My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior, because he has looked with favor on the humble condition of his slave. Surely from now on all generations will call me blessed, because the Mighty One has done great things for me, and his name is holy. His mercy is from generation to generation on those who fear him, He has done a mighty deed with his arm. He has scattered the proud because of the thoughts of their hearts. He has toppled the mighty from their thrones and exalted the lowly. He has satisfied the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, mindful of his mercy, just as he spoke to our ancestors Abraham and his descendants forever. And Mary stayed with Elizabeth then about three months and returned home.
All right. <clears throat> so what's happened here, right? And the things that we've heard and what's going on, you know, really what's happening. Well, as I mentioned, Gabriel comes to Mary with some pretty big news. Uh, he tells her, though she's a virgin, she'll become pregnant with a son, and this son will be no ordinary child. He'll be the son of God, formed in her womb or placed in her womb by the hand of the Holy Spirit. Uh, we can look at this basically in two sections. Uh, verses 26 through 38, Gabriel's visit to Mary and her response to the news of Jesus. And verses 39 through 56, Mary's visit to Elizabeth and their response uh, to the presence of Jesus. Now, <clears throat> something we should notice in the first section is the similarity between what happens with Mary and what happened with Zechariah as I went through that just ahead of our reading. You see, Gabriel came to each of them. What he told them followed a very similar sequence. Again, Gabriel speaks from the scriptures to Mary, quoting Genesis 6, Isaiah 7, 2 Samuel 7, Isaiah 14, and Daniel 7. Some, something we should also notice about the second section uh, following that with Elizabeth and Mary is the joy that both women experience and share together. A joy and fellowship created through the shared understanding of salvation of what God is doing uh, in their lives, <clears throat> that God is fulfilling his promise through what he's doing in both of them. And this brings us to the first point that I'd like to make today, uh, which is this. All of God's promises, right, are fulfilled in Jesus because Jesus is the promise of God's word. Jesus is the promise of God's word. You see, all of God's promises are ultimately fulfilled in Jesus Christ, and all of God's word correctly understood, points to him. What Gabriel is telling both Zechariah and Mary is that God is redeeming his people just like he always said he would do. Jesus is the promised Savior, and now it's being revealed. Uh, the promised Savior is not just a human person, not just a man who will be the Messiah. The promised Savior is the eternal Son of God. Uh, now, a Savior is necessary because people are in need of rescue. Rescue is needed because all people are born in a fallen condition, and this fallen condition came as the result of sin, which was the choice of our first parents, Adam and Eve, and it's what's been passed down to each of us along the way. You see, back in the beginning, after God created everything and Adam and Eve were in the garden, things took a turn south. Adam and Eve did the one thing they were told not to do. They ate the fruit from the one tree they were told not to eat from, and when they did this, they disobeyed God. They broke trust with him, and you could say they set the whole ship and everyone on it off course. Now, when they did this, they exercised a choice that God had given them freely to choose whom or what they would love. Uh, and at this point, what they chose was no longer God. In the Bible, love is not so much connected to how you feel about someone as much as it's connected to what you do for them. Uh, it involves the idea of loyalty and commitment and ultimately taking the right actions towards someone else. God had told Adam and Eve ahead of time, the day you eat the fruit of that tree, you will surely die or you will die the death, Genesis 2.17. And this is exactly what happened. Now, they didn't die physically immediately, but the wages or the earnings of sin is death. It's a corruption of nature that misses the mark of God's goodness. It's a separation from proper relationship with him. And it's a life and an existence that at one time or another ultimately leads to death, and that's nothing that any of us can escape. God came to them, however, in the garden. He made a sacrifice on their behalf, clothing them with animal skins. He placed them outside of the garden, which was a safe distance away from his holiness. But before he did that, he talked with them. In Genesis 3, God spoke to Adam, telling him life was going to be hard. 
working the ground and feeding yourself, Adam, is not going to be easy now. Uh, he spoke to Eve, telling her marriage and children would be tough. Your desire will be for your husband, but he'll rule over you, and you'll have pains in, in bearing and, and raising children. Uh, but prior to that, God spoke to the serpent about the coming Savior. In Genesis 3.15, speaking to the serpent, God said, I will put hostility between you and the woman, between her seed and your seed. He will strike your head, and you will strike his heel. Now, seed means offspring or descendant, child of. Uh, woman is referring to Eve. Striking the head means to decisively kill. Uh, striking the heel means a crippling injury, one that uh, will lead to death. So what God's saying is this, through a descendant of Eve, I will send someone who will defeat your power, who will defeat the power of the devil. But the devil will deliver to him what looks like a crippling injury, and this is how I'm going to save you. All of God's word following this shows how the person God would send would not only be a human person, but would also be a divine person. This Savior wouldn't just be a man whom God would send. Uh, he would also be God himself. He would be the Son of God. And, of course, we know this promise in Genesis 3.15 to have been fulfilled. It was fulfilled not only in Jesus' birth, but in his death on the cross where his heel literally was struck. Uh, and where the, devil, where the devil was firmly defeated, where his head was crushed. And Jesus emerged then uh, victorious from the grave. As I mentioned, uh, the word of God from Genesis 3.15 and forward has pointed to his salvation in Jesus. So it should be no surprise then when Gabriel comes to Mary, he brings here the same word of God spoken through Moses and all the other prophets uh, for generations. So let's look back at what Gabriel says in verses 30 through 33. <clears throat> uh, beginning there, don't be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Now listen, you will conceive and give birth to a son. You will call his name Jesus, which literally means God saves. Uh, he will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord will give him the throne of his father David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. What Gabriel is saying here is no different from what God uh, told King David. Uh, in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 12 through 13, uh, he said this, when you're speaking to David, he said, when your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring or your seed after you who will come from your own body and I will establish his kingdom. He will build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. It's also no different than the words spoken through Isaiah about this child. A child will be born for us, a son will be given to us, and the government will be on his shoulders. He will be named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. He will reign on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish and sustain it with justice and righteousness from now on and forever. The zeal of the Lord will accomplish this. That's Isaiah 9, verses 6 through 7. So, can you imagine... Mary hearing all of this, uh, thinking, wow, the promised eternal king in the line of David is actually coming through me. You know, she's engaged to Joseph, who is a descendant of David, so that may seem a really likely way for it to happen, right? <clears throat> but that's not how God's going to do it. God is not going to conceive this child naturally, so to speak, because this child isn't going to just come into existence through conception. And the reason for that is he already exists, and he has always existed. Uh, which brings us to the second point that I'd like to make today, and it's this. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is the second 
person of the Trinity, right? God reveals himself to us as three persons who are one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They've always existed together. They do everything together. Uh, they share in all of the same uh, qualities and characteristics of what it means to be God. Uh, but while being distinct persons, they can't be separated in their divine union. They are one God. And Jesus, being the second person of the Trinity, is equal in power, glory, authority, and eternity with the Father and the Son, or the Father and the Spirit. So Jesus is not just coming into existence at conception. He's coming into humanity at conception. Uh, now, human beings come into exist at the moment we're conceived uh, in the womb. We are not pre-existence, and we are not eternal beings. We are actually created beings who come into existence, body and soul, at the moment of conception. Jesus is both God and man. He's fully God and he's fully human. But he has existed eternally prior to adding humanity to himself. <clears throat> Now, it's important that Jesus is born of a virgin, not only because God's word says he will be. Isaiah 7, the virgin will be with child. His name will be called Emmanuel, literally meaning God with us. But because God is holy, he is totally separate from sin. Uh, so Jesus had to be conceived naturally, otherwise he would have, uh, or, you know, or had, had, had Jesus been conceived naturally, he would have only been a man. Uh, he would have inherited the sin of Adam. He would not be without sin. Um, and Jesus, as he has said, was born to die. He's here to give his life as a ransom for many, Luke 10, to atone for our sin. And he wouldn't be able to do this if he had his own sin that he had to atone for. So Jesus could not have been born naturally. He could not have been born in a way that would have uh, transferred the sin of humanity, the sin of Adam, to him. So in a supernatural way, God has truly become human, and we might think of that as becoming human plus, right? Taking up everything it means to be human while retaining everything it means to be God and coming through the woman as her seed or as her offspring, right, by being placed uh, in the womb of the virgin, but not conceived there. So, a few things I want to point out in verses 26 through 29 with respect to this. So, let's take a look at those. <clears throat> in the sixth month refers to Elizabeth's pregnancy, verse 26. Uh, it was in the sixth month uh, that these things occurred. Mary was a virgin engaged to be married, verse 27. Uh, virgin can mean literally, it can mean that literally, or it can mean a woman who hasn't been married yet. And what it's referring to about Mary is both of those. She literally is a virgin, and she has never been married before. Uh, connecting then to verse 34, you can see Mary had never been intimate with a man because she says it. And so everything's a really big surprise to her. How is this going to happen? Because I've never been intimate with a man. I've never been married. I've never done anything uh, that, 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 that should produce a child. Uh, she says, I've not been with a man, so how's this going to happen? And Gabriel replies to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Another point that I want to make here before we move on is this. Jesus is the son of David. Jesus is the son of David. Jesus is the promised eternal king of God's people. Jesus is the one who fulfills the promises made to David, and that's because Jesus is the one those promises were given to. Now, let me explain this. Right? I mentioned 2 Samuel 7 earlier in connection with Isaiah 9. 2 Samuel 7, I will raise up your offspring after you, your seed, and I will establish his kingdom forever. Isaiah 9, a child will be born for us. He'll have all these names associated with God, right? So, 
Isaiah goes on, he will reign on the throne of David forever, and the zeal of the Lord will accomplish this. In 2 Samuel, God is talking to David, but he's talking about someone other than David. In Isaiah 9, God is talking about a child with his own names and attributes. He's saying, this is who I told David about, and it will be my zeal, my power, my strength, my hand which accomplishes this. Now, the Jews understood from their scriptures that God would send a Savior, that the Messiah would be the promised son of David. But they were thinking a man raised up by God, a man operating in God's power, not a man who is God, not a man who is the Lord. When you connect this to what Gabriel says in verse 35, the power of the Most High will overshadow you, therefore the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God, overshadow is not a euphemism for beget. Uh, it doesn't mean any kind of human marital interaction. It's the same language used to describe God's glory coming to rest on the tabernacle in Exodus 40, 35, when God sent his presence among his people by sending his glory to rest on the tabernacle, the tent that he had instructed them to make that would move around with them in the wilderness. And since Mary's child would be holy which is not possible for anyone naturally born, and only God is holy, this child is none other than the Holy One coming to rest inside of her body. Now, holy does not simply mean morally upright. Uh, the Son of David is the Holy One of God, who is God himself taking on the tabernacle of human flesh. As John says in John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, right? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word became flesh and took up residence among us, verse 14. Took up residence is literally, in the original language, tabernacled with us, or took on the tent with us. So, the long-awaited salvation promised through David has now come. He has come to redeem and to ultimately restore his creation, and he's done this by truly coming into it, right? actually becoming what he's made. You may wonder at this point, you know, how much did Mary really understand? Uh, you know, I often think about that song, uh, Mary, Did You Know?, uh, did you know that your baby boy would be the savior of the world? Did you know that uh, his hand hung the stars? Did you know that uh, he would open the eyes of the blind? Right? That when you kiss his face, uh, you kiss the face of God? You know, I'd like to point out <clears throat> something here. Life is a learning process, and it's no different with coming to understand and apply God's word, especially coming to understand and apply God's salvation. Uh, to grow in relationship with God through trust and obedience, whatever your level of understanding is, God's always been looking for the same response. He's been looking for the response of trust and obedience, which is the essence of faith. Though I do not understand everything, I trust what I do know. I trust what God is showing me now, and I'll be obedient to him. <clears throat> Uh, I think Gabriel helps Mary out a bit here in verses 36 through 38. You know, you may be wondering how this will all be, Mary, how it's all going to happen. You know, you're asking me this question about, well, I've never, I've never been intimate with a man. I don't understand how I'm going to have a child. But consider your relative Elizabeth. She's past childbearing years. There's no way that it could happen for her naturally either. Uh, everyone's, in fact, given her the name childless but she's in her sixth month for uh, nothing. Nothing will be impossible with God. You know, Mary is in a pretty precarious circumstance, I'd like to point out. She's engaged. Uh, becoming pregnant before her wedding is going to be a, a big problem. Uh, it's most likely going to stop the wedding. Uh, it, it'll make her a social outcast, uh, and with no husband and a tarnished reputation, she'll have no proper legal status, no livelihood. 
Now, we know that Gabriel also makes a visit to Joseph and, and, and talks with him about these things, and so he does not uh, put her away or he does not call off the engagement. But she doesn't know any of this yet. And she's staring down uh, some, some really difficult things. But Mary simply replies, <clears throat> I am the Lord's servant. May it be done to me according to your word. Again, something I'd like to point out here is the action Mary takes following this. In verses 39, and after that, Mary goes to see Elizabeth. They greet each other. The baby in Elizabeth's tummy uh, jumps at the sound of Mary's voice. And you might wonder, well, why is that? Well, we're told that John, uh, the baby who is in Elizabeth's tummy, was to be filled with the Holy Spirit from conception. Jesus, who is God, is within the womb of Mary. So there's a mutual recognition of what God is doing and the presence of the Lord among them both. Uh, Elizabeth prophesies as a result, she who has believed is blessed because what was spoken to her by the Lord will be fulfilled, verse 45. And Mary responds then with a song of praise, recounting what God has done for his people over time verses 46 through 55. And it brings me to the final point that I'd like to make today, which is this. Jesus is God's salvation. Jesus is God's salvation. You know, salvation is not a thing. It's a person, and that person is Jesus Christ. God who is great, who is holy, who is mighty, who made the heavens and the earth, who made you and me, has humbled himself and gone to the cross, but first he has humbled himself by becoming a child. You might say, why is that, right? What does that accomplish? Or, uh, you know, what, what's the real purpose for it? Well, I want to, to, to remind you of some words that the, that the earliest Christians came uh, uh, to, to state with respect to this, and they said, what has not been assumed cannot be redeemed. What has not been assumed cannot be redeemed. Or what God has not taken up cannot be fixed. You see, the doctrine of the incarnation is the distinctive of Christianity. God has added everything to himself it means to be human. He has lived a fully human life, not only in his life, death, and resurrection, but in his birth. Uh, he has done this in a fallen world, just like you and me. God is not only our creator, he is our creator and our redeemer. And he knows everything about us, not only from the perspective of heaven, but from the perspective of earth. He knows what we face, he knows what we struggle with, he knows everything that's wrong. Jesus has borne all of our sin, not in part, but the whole. And by taking up our broken existence, going through death on our behalf, living the life that we could not live, being tempted in every way that we are, yet without sin, and being raised to life, we are assured of the hope of his glory and grace. He was born, as the uh, great hymn says, that man no more may die. The incarnation shows us something very meaningful. Those who believe... Uh, though they die, they will not die, <clears throat> as Jesus says. Uh, God does not despise his creation. He loves it. He loves you and he loves me. He doesn't hate the body. He doesn't hate the creation. The fall has not put anything beyond God's ability to repair and restore. There's nothing in this world, there's nothing in your life, and there's nothing in mine that can't ultimately be redeemed and restored by God. You know, it may be helpful at this point to get a, a big picture reset by taking a look at the four words we've been using to describe uh, God's actions in time, God's redemptive history with people. Uh, and those four words are creation, fall, redemption, and restoration. Right? Creation, fall, redemption, and restoration. Going back to the creative project that God has undertaken, in the beginning, what God made was very good. 
people enjoyed the goodness of the creation with God. And yes, sin and death have entered the picture. People fell. But God is faithful to his creative purpose. Jesus has come in the flesh at the right time in the plan to accomplish redemption. He's come as a real human being. He's lived in a way we never could, given his life in our place, and has come through death demonstrating the restoration of the body in his resurrection. When the time is right, he will return to judge all things. To eradicate all sin and evildoers from his creation, all will be raised either to the resurrection of eternal life or to the resurrection of eternal judgment, to the resurrection of wrath. A new heaven and a new earth will be revealed, and those who believe will be fully restored body and soul, inheriting all the blessings of eternal life with God and with one another. It should be noted God has undertaken all of this with the end in mind from the beginning. Meaning creation was not finished, so to speak, when God rested on the seventh day. It was no surprise what Adam and Eve did, and it was no change of plans to jump in an earth suit, so to speak, uh, 2,000 years ago. God has been revealing through his word and through his actions toward his people over time This has always been the plan, which will now be fully revealed in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And the history of God's dealings with his people have all pointed to this. The promises of God's salvation, or the promises of God's salvation, sorry, the promises of salvation God has given his people were actually given not to his people but to the one who would save them, and that's Jesus Christ. The Son of God who would save them by becoming one of them to accomplish what not one of us can by doing it as one of us on our behalf and then be able to give the promises to us in himself. This is what Paul says in Galatians 3.16. Now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed But God does not say to his seeds, as though referring to many, but and to your seed, referring to the one who is Christ. Do you get that? The promises were spoken to Abraham, to his seed, not to his seeds, but to the one who is Christ. It's also much of what Mary talks about in her song of praise in verses 46 through 55. So let's review that. Mary starts out praising God. My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. Why is that? She goes on, because he has looked with favor on the humble condition of his slave. From now on, all generations will call me blessed because the Lord has done great things for me, and his name is holy. Verse 49. His mercy is from generation to generation on those who fear him. He has done a mighty deed with his arm. He has scattered the proud because of the thoughts of their hearts. He has toppled the mighty from their thrones. He has exalted the lowly. He has satisfied the hungry with good things. He has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, mindful of his mercy, just as he spoke to our ancestors, to Abraham and his descendants forever. Verse 55. Now, a few things I want to point out here. <clears throat> Mary's song tells what God does for her, what he has done for his people. She speaks quite clearly of his judgments on the mighty and his blessings for the humble. And she indicates all of this is in fulfillment of God's promises to his people long ago, his promise to Abraham and his descendants. The past tense statements in verses 51 through 54 actually express what God is going to do through Jesus, the coming Messiah. Actions that have already begun to take place in that the Messiah, Jesus, has already come into Mary's womb. He is the mighty arm of God's salvation, and what God is doing through Jesus is the same kind of thing God has done in the past history of his people Israel. Mary concludes then, Jesus is the fulfillment of all the promises, the eternal promises, those given forever. Verse 55, 
spoken to our ancestors, to Abraham and his descendants forever. In other words, Jesus is the forever fulfillment of God's promise. Now, the term descendants is also that original word seed. So a vital connection that we should make, uh, an understanding that we should have through all of this is Jesus is the seed of the woman, Genesis 3.15. Jesus is the seed of Abraham, Genesis 22.18. Jesus is the seed of David, 2 Samuel 7.12. Jesus is the seed which falls to the ground or to the earth. John 12.24, Jesus speaking says, I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of grain falls to the ground and dies... It remains only a single seed, but if it dies, it produces many seeds. Something we should see from that is that Jesus is the one who rebuilds the fallen tent of David, Amos 9.11, who restores God's household, 2 Samuel 9, and who brings those who receive him into God's household by coming to us in the tent of or the tabernacle of fallen humanity. As John 1, 12 through 14 says, <clears throat> to all who did receive him, he gave them the right to be children of God or members of God's household, children born not of blood or of the will of man or of the flesh, but born of God. I think we should notice in verse 28, going back there, the humble condition Mary's talking about is her feeling of unworthiness for such honor from God. Uh, it connects to her response to Gabriel when he says, Rejoice, favored woman. And Mary was troubled, wondering, what kind of greeting is this? Then Gabriel tells her, don't be afraid, Mary, you have found favor with God. You know, God's favor is completely undeserved, and that's what grace is. Humility or the recognition, I don't deserve this, that's a true recognition of God's holiness and goodness in the face of your own sinfulness. It's the response on the part of Mary that actually puts her alongside the godly people in Israel. God has always shown his holiness through his saving actions for his people. God's people have never deserved what he's done. And the ultimate action of God's salvation is his own humility. Not just humbling himself to the point of death, even death on a cross, but humbling himself to take on the form of a man, becoming a slave. The heart of the gospel, the good news of Jesus, is that God has shown his love and mercy to undeserving people. God has come to us as one of us, literally as a child, bringing those who believe into his family, into his household as children, not through our own merit, but through his. As children in God's family, we're to grow up or to walk in a new way of life, one that involves imitating our Creator, growing to maturity as we look to and adopt His way of life, one that we can see clearly through His Word and through His own actions with us. Growing to understand God's salvation in Jesus should then be a source of great joy. It should bring increasing gratitude that comes from more deeply understanding what God has done, and it should be reason to rejoice and share together with others. You know, what happens with Mary and Elizabeth is they break out into song, uh, literally singing God's praises. Uh, you know, they go to one another, they spend time with one another, and they share in the Lord together. I look specifically at the interaction of Mary and Elizabeth here, and I see their joy increasing as their understanding of what God is doing increases. And I look at what God has done among us as a human being, 
searching out his people, spending time with his disciples. Jesus actually enjoyed spending time with them. What it reminds me of is God's salvation involves real people. Right? Real people with real names in real situations at real points in time who live out his salvation person to person in real relationships. And through this coming to an understanding like we see with Mary and Elizabeth uh, should bring great joy. Something I'd like to point out is it may seem like nothing has really happened yet. I mean, you look at where things, things are, uh, you know, so Mary has conceived, right? She's early in the pregnancy. Uh, Elizabeth is, is, is six months along. Uh, it may seem like not much has really happened yet, but the seed of Jesus' life, the presence of God himself, has entered Mary. And it's the understanding of this that brings such joy, that God's promise is being fulfilled. You know, Jesus spoke about a similar seed when he said the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. It's the smallest seed in the garden, but it grows into the largest of all plants. You know, the seed of new life, the seed of Jesus' life within you, does start small in each of us who receive him. But the thought I'd like to leave you with is this. God will fulfill his purpose, and the deposit of that seed is the guarantee of the day of restoration. So do you trust that? Do you trust that God will do great things from seemingly small beginnings? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we are grateful for you. God, thank you that you are the one who is good, the one who is faithful, the one who will fulfill his word, the one who has revealed himself fully in Jesus Christ, and the one who will bring all those who are in Christ into the eternal blessings uh, associated with him. God, I pray that as your people, we would grow in faithfulness to you, that we would grow in an understanding of your salvation, that we would grow in relationship with you and with one another. And above all, we would find joy uh, in these things, uh, that we would truly be grateful to you. And we would trust that your will will be done, that your purpose will be accomplished. And even though uh, the seed may seem to start out small. Uh, you're the one who makes it grow. Uh, we thank you, Lord, and we praise you. It's in your name, Jesus, that we pray. Amen.
All right, well, that's what we have for today. And as we draw our time uh, to a close, just a couple things I'd like to mention. If you're staying on for the Disciples Gathering, which is a live gathering on Zoom, uh, and you've already got the link, that will start 10 minutes after the end of uh, things here. And if you are new with us and you'd like to join that, uh, we meet on Zoom to pray together, to share in the Scripture together, and to talk with one another. You can go to our website, obxcc.org, and fill out the contact form. That comes to us uh, right away, and we can send a link back to you. So if you'd like to join, you're welcome to. If you just have uh, some general questions, uh, hopefully the information there will answer those. But if you'd like someone to reach out to you, then fill out that contact form, and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. Thank you.